Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, One quick announcement before we begin today, and I'll say it again at the end. It's our annual meeting today, and it is at 1215. I understand that in the past it's been between services. This year it is following the 11 o'clock service. There's a... um, our annual meeting at 1215 and then we'll have a potluck following that so yes okay sandwiches provided bring a side dish and uh, please come back for that so that we have a quorum Uh, one of the uh, things we're doing today is voting on our constitutional revisions and so it's very important we have a quorum just to begin with (laughs) because we have to vote on our budget too so (laughs) Um, with that let us begin the worship order today and we'll begin with a confession and forgiveness please stand as you are able blessed be the holy trinity one god who stretches out the heavens who sends light to the nations who gives breath to us all. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Loving God, we confess that we have turned from your way to follow our own ways. Forgive us for the times we have Even when we have done wrong, God makes us right. Even when we have messed up, God puts us together. God's love never runs out. God never tires of calling us beloved children. Hear God say to you now that your sins are forgiven. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Also with you. Take this time now to share the peace with one another.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. you. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods who, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all, are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, 
if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated, and I invite the kids to come forward for children's message. guys are way over there. (laughs) I didn't bring my little stool, otherwise I would have moved to you. So how are you? Good. Good to see you guys. So I have a question. Has your room at home ever been messy? You ever been told to clean up your room? Yeah. And what kind of things do you usually have messing up your room? Maybe like toys, clothes, laying around, didn't make your bed, things like that. Yeah. Well, we have messes at home. Um, do you ever see those type of messes here in, in this sanctuary? Is this ever messy? Now, it looks pretty clean most of the time, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Just like we have messes at home, we also can have messes inside us. A lot of times, um, we think we're supposed to clean up those messes um, before we come here. And, uh, or hide it so that uh, everything looks clean and, and no one sees the messy that we feel inside. But today's scripture... Um, is about a man who lets his messiness inside show to the whole congregation. He's sitting in the, in the church like this, and Jesus is preaching, and in the middle of it, worship, he just lets everybody know, and what they call it in this is an unclean spirit. But basically, he's just letting all his secrets out. And Jesus doesn't get mad or upset with him at all. He just helps the person. And so, even though the sanctuary is always clean, you don't have to think that you have to be clean inside to come to church. And actually, if we share more of what's messy inside of us, um, that's what church is for, to to help each other um, clean that up together. And so that's our message for today. The good news that Jesus gave us is that um, we can come if we're feeling messy inside and don't have to clean up our mess before we come to church and before we share that with each other. So let's pray. Repeat after me prayer. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus, you for Jesus. Who, shows who shows us how to receive and share your healing love. 
even when things are messy. Thank you and amen. All right. Have a seat. So we're in chapter one of the book of Mark right now, and this gospel begins uh, telling about Jesus's ministry with last week with him calling the disciples. And then the next thing he does is he goes to a synagogue where he worships and teaches. And he teaches with authority as one who knows God. So the people are wondering, what is this? Who is this? And there's a bit of a jab at the local pastors at the time because it says um, that apparently they weren't teaching with authority. So here is the scene. So you're in worship, just like you are today, and you've just heard the best sermon you've heard in like forever. So think about how you feel. And now the scene is suddenly interrupted. And one of you sitting kind of mid-back stands up and in a loud voice declares that you know exactly who your preacher is today, their true identity. Only this person has an unclean spirit and tends to speak in plurals using we and us to describe himself. He cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Or maybe he says it more in fear. What have you come to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? We don't really know. He says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. So what's going on in your mind right now? You just went from best sermon you've ever heard, you're feeling pretty good, to this. Could cut the air with a knife moment. There's this thin line between confusion and clarity. And that's how Jesus begins his mission, in conflict and disruption. As a a pastor, this is always the fear of the annual meeting. (laughs) He's immediately placed in this position where no one in the room wants to be. And no one wants to go there. But he'll go into it. He'll go into what we want to run from, steer away from, avoid. Please just sit down and be quiet, would you? But Jesus confronts the unclean, that which makes us spiritually dirty, our deepest shame, the enemy within that we hate, that thin line between confusion and clarity. The man realizes that Jesus has the ability to heal and change his life, to heal his inner dis-ease. And he's not sure that he wants transformation and health. Because it's a funny thing about those things which make us feel spiritually dirty or unclean those secrets. They become a part of our identity. They become part of who we are, our secret identity. The dirty deeds you were never caught doing or the ones that came to light and you feel humiliated by. Or maybe the shame that others put upon you for things you have no control over, like becoming ill the part of negative self-talk that goes on inside 
so much a part of who you think you are. And it's scary to imagine life without that burden of shame, without that spiritual dirt, because it's part of you. Whether you like it or not, it's part of you. In Psalm 111, we hear that God is always with it, with us, steadfast. The God isn't an interim God. Pastors that come and go, leaders that come and go, but God is steadfast. Will be here ever with you, always. Gerald May is a psychiatrist, and he wrote a word on this steadfastness of God. It was a word from God that he received in prayer, and he wrote it this way. You are rarely aware of me, how I embrace you as you read the morning paper. My arms cradle you. My breath is on your hair as you listen to the news. I know your unspoken feelings, for I am closer to your heart than you are now or ever will be. That's how close God is. And that's the God that we have, whom Jesus reveals to us intimately. And yet we doubt this presence because we've known darkness and we've known lostness. We've known when we've been sucked into our secret lives and it's overtaken us. When we've been swallowed up by those secrets. And in those times we protest God was not there. It was so dark. It was so lonely. St. John of the Cross writes about this experience. He's a, a great poet and prose author, and he writes and coins the phrase, dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is when you feel abandoned by or lost by God. He explained that in these times, what's happening, he says the light of God being so bright as to blind the seeker who then thinks that God is not here, while all the time being bathed in the light which cannot be seen. That those moments of darkness, infinite loneliness, are the moments that we come closest to the mystery of God. That God surrounds and enfolds us in the darkness, but is not touching, for God knows we could not handle that touch at that time. So back to the first act of Jesus in Mark. Taking this lesson of God's ever-present steadfastness, Jesus then takes that step further. That God will go where no one else wants to go or is willing to go. That God will change you when God goes there. That God will enter your secrets, your shame, your spiritual dirt, and change you. God will touch you when no one else will and God will not touch you when you cannot handle that touch. Either way, God is present, and that presence will change you. So despite his questioning, Jesus heals the man. Mark tells of how the man convulses and cries out as he's being healed. And that's the thing. Sometimes change for the better, radical change, is not always pleasant. It's not always accepted. It's difficult. For you're changing your identity. And that requires courage. There's a familiar quote by Martin Luther. You see it a lot these days in like, Lutheran t-shirts and things like that, cups, uh, crazy little humor things. And, and the quote is, sin boldly. 
Luther said, sin boldly. What that statement comes from is that Luther is acknowledging that sin is a part of our daily lives. We can't help but sin if we wait to act until we are without sin, then we'll never ever do anything to help anyone or help ourselves because we're in this catch-22. We cannot act until we have not sinned, then we will not act at all. So Luther's full quote is, be a sinner. And sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin and death and the world. So as long as we are here in this world, we have to sin. This life is not a dwelling place of righteousness. In Mark's Gospel. Jesus' first act is to reclaim this man. Jesus reclaims us. Salvation is a relationship. Relationship with God, who is always present and steadfast, as we hear in Psalm 111, and who goes into our messes, who sheds light in our darkness, upon our secrets, that we want to keep ourselves down with. And when that happens, we are changed. And that's salvation. That's salvation. And that's the kind of God we're dealing with. Jesus is willing to cross boundaries, all boundaries, even the boundaries of sin and death, in order to bring good news and to bring life. That is his mission. I have come to bring them life. Life everlasting. And God is constantly working, shaping, forming, shifting, stirring us. God changes us. Acknowledge our brokenness. Where do you hide your spiritual dirt and come clean? Be courageous. Sin boldly. Believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. And then share the peace with one another. This peace, the peace of God with us always. The peace of Christ who crosses boundaries to bring life. The peace of our chaos being changed. The peace of a new identity. The touch of peace. I closed my meditation this morning by sharing a poem that I found in a newsletter, church newsletter. It's about sharing the peace, the time in our worship service in which I invite you to share the peace with one another. Now, I've been here long enough to know that someone's going to get stuck on the idea of sharing the peace, the literal idea. How do you do it? Do you shake with a hand? Do you give a kiss? Do you hug? Do you just make a peace sign? Do you make a bow? What is the right way to share the peace? And getting stuck in that, that's an example of weak sin, right? We're to sin boldly. So don't wait until you figure out what's the right way to share the peace. Sin boldly. Whether you know what the right way or not, share the peace. And you'll see why in this poem. We share the peace because Christ crossed the boundaries of death to give us life. That we may share the peace in a handshake or a hug or a kiss or a simple nod of the head. So hear this deeper message, the message of a touch of peace, whether literal or figurative. How Christ is with you will go into your secret life and change you. So here's the poem. What is all this touching in church? It used to be 
a person could come to church and sit in the pew and not be bothered with all this friendliness. And certainly not by touching. I used to come to church and leave untouched. Now, I have to be nervous about what's expected of me. I have to worry about responding to the person sitting next to me. Oh, I wish it could be the way it used to be. I could just sit and ask the person next to me, how are you? And the person could answer, oh, just fine. And we'd both go home strangers who have known each other for 20 years. But now the minister asks us to look at each other. And I'm worried about the hurt look that I saw in that woman's eyes. And now I'm concerned because when the minister asked us to pass the peace, the man next to me held my hand so tightly I wondered if he had been touched in years. And now I'm upset because the lady next to me cried and apologized and said it was because I was so kind and that she needed a friend right now. And now I have to get involved now I have to suffer when my community suffers. Now I have to be more than a person coming to observe a service. That man last week told me I'd never know how much I touched him. All I did was smile and tell him that I understood what it was to feel lonely. Lord, I am not big enough to touch and be touched. That stretching scares me. What if I disappoint somebody? What if I'm too pushy? What if I cling too much? What if somebody ignores me? Pass the peace. The peace of God be with you and with you, and mean it. Lord, I can't resist meaning it. I'm touched by it. I'm enveloped by it. I find I do care about the person next to me. I find I'm involved, and I'm scared Oh, Lord, be here beside me. You touch me, Lord, so that I can touch and be touched, so that I can care and be cared for, so that I can share my life with all of those others that belong to you. And this touching in church, Lord, it's changing me. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the lasting. Amen. Confident that God, our light and our salvation, hears us when we pray, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For those who speak your word throughout the church in the world, O God, and for educational institutions that prepare leaders, that you will lift up prophets in our congregations, let us pray. For the works of God revealed in and through creation, for an end to pollution and unjust use of natural resources, and for good weather this season, let us pray. For peace and justice throughout the world, for political leaders at all levels, and for those who provide public services, that you will grant them wisdom as they carry out their tasks, let us pray. For the homeless, the unemployed, the underemployed, and their advocates, for the sick, the suffering, and their caregivers, and for the weak in body, mind, and spirit, especially Greg McKinley, that your compassion may be felt by all in need, let us pray. For those in our congregation celebrating special events, for those missing from our worship today, and for friends and family both near and far, let us pray. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed, especially the theologian Thomas Aquinas, whom the church commemorates today, who witnessed your love in their lives and in this world, that through them our own faith will grow, grow stronger, let us pray. Merciful God, you hear our prayers even before we speak them. Receive them for the sake of the one whom, through whom you have revealed your goodness. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for this time of sharing of the gifts. Um, this morning I'm bringing you greetings from the Stephen Ministry program again. Last week I spoke to you about our beginning of our program. We're at the stage where we're recruiting people that are interested in becoming Stephen Ministers. Yesterday, Vicki Donnell and myself, we had a wonderful brunch with a group of people that are looking at becoming Stephen Ministers. And today I have one more video to share with you. We are hoping that you will prayerfully consider uh, coming and joining this first class. We're wanting to start it in uh, February, and some of you, I know, have continued to ask questions. We would like you to let us know if you are one of those people that would like to become part of this first class. Um, we will be meeting with you and uh, beginning the actual uh, ministry. So I hope you enjoy the video today and feel free to call me or Vicki. Uh, we'd love to answer your questions. Thank you. Stephen Ministry is a place where people can come who are hurting. It could be from a loss of a family member. It could be a loss of a job. It's a caring ministry. It's for people who are going through crisis in their life. As a caregiver in the Stephen Ministry, I walk alongside and show Christ's love to the care receivers. Typically, the care receiver themselves comes up with the answer, but it is process-oriented. 
not results oriented. We're not there to fix them. But they need a Christian friend to sound it out and to listen to them in a confidential manner. Typically, we will meet with our care receivers about an hour and a half a week. It's an opportunity for the person to just share whatever they're ready for that day. And if they're not ready, they're not ready. They, the, the key is to make them feel very comfortable. To listen to them intently. And ask her, what are your prayer needs? What should we pray for this week? And during my prayer time, I pray for her. That's the gift that uh, Christ gives us, the gift of mercy. No one likes to go through pain alone, and it's a good opportunity to lead them to Christ if they're not already, or to strengthen their walk. We are the caregiver, and Christ is in the center as the caregiver in all the situations. We can help them to be uplifted and be closer to God through this uh, crisis. He's using me and the other student ministers as his ambassadors to show that he does exist and that he does love his children. And it's just very rewarding to, to know that you've helped someone walk a very difficult path and to get them to the other side. Merciful God, receive these gifts we bring, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Through this meal, unite us as your own. Shine the light of justice and mercy. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. and merciful God. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
In great love, you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This meal of forgiveness is prepared and served to all who want to receive this meal. We will commune along the railings. You may stand or kneel as you are able, and you'll receive the bread, then the dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice, and there are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know. Come, let us eat. For my soul, 
you to stand as you are able and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Morning star, fair and bright, you have refreshed us again with heavenly food. You are our dearest treasure. Go with us now, today, tomorrow, every day, that we tell the story of your never-ending love and sing your praise, both now and forever. Amen. May be seated for announcements. I'll turn your attention to the messenger. Please read through that. It's got a, what our weekly and upcoming events are. Again, today is our annual meeting at 1215 with a lunch and fellowship after. So please come back and join us for that important meeting. There's also a Camp Tomashinga informational meeting today at 10, and it'll be over by the Fellowship Hall, so uh, please come to that if you'd like to learn more about camp this summer. With that, let us uh, please stand and receive the benediction. 
The God of glory dwell in you richly. Name you beloved and shine brightly on your path. And the blessing of Almighty God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture you, gather resources for growing ministries, offer healing and care to all in need. Go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 